Hey guys, welcome back to the Dead Church series. Throughout this series, we've been looking at what real Christianity is, according to the Bible. What real Christianity looks like according to what Jesus taught and what the apostles were teaching. And we've been looking at what faith means, what obedience means, what love means. Throughout the last few videos, we've been discussing what it means to live holy lives. The word holy is a word that means we are different. We're distinct. There's something that sets us apart. We look different than everybody else. And we've been talking about what the Bible says it means for us to live holy lives. We've been talking about what it means to seek first the kingdom and how that means that all of our priorities have to change. And when our priorities change, it doesn't just mean we make sure it happens. It means it comes first. It's what we build our lives around. It is what we focus on. It is the most important thing in our life. And it is the thing that we spend most of our time doing. In this video, I want to talk about family. I want to talk about what is the role of family in a Christian's life. As we've seen in our previous videos, the average Christian life is often very family focused. Okay, they spend a lot of time working a job so that they can provide a good life for their families. They spend a lot of time with their kids and Christians often view family as their ministry. Or in other words, they serve God by taking care of their families. Okay, Christians keep families nearby. They have family get-togethers. They celebrate holidays with their families. They go on vacations with their families. Growing up in church, I was always told that it would be my responsibility to provide for my family. I was told that I would need to make sure that my family was being taken care of. I would need to make sure that the kids were well trained. I would need to make sure the family keeps reading the Bible and going to church. It wasn't just that this was something that I should make sure happens. I was being taught that this should be my focus. Almost all Christians have heard that we're supposed to focus on the family. Our church culture has told us that the Christian life should be centered on the family. The family unit is what is most important. We should build strong, good families founded on faith, hope, and love. First and foremost, we should make sure our families have what they need. Most Christians view family as one of the most important aspects to the Christian life. Many people think that it's what Christianity is all about. Here's what Jesus had to say about family. Don't think that I came to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be members of his own family. Those who love their father or mother more than they love me are not worthy of me. Those who love their son or daughter more than they love me are not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who try to hold on to their lives will give up true life. Those who give up their lives for my sake will hold on to true life. Here, Jesus is saying something so very different than what the church is telling us today. Jesus is saying he came to split up families, not join them together. He's saying your family, your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, they have to take a back seat and the kingdom of God has to come first or you're not even worthy of him. Now, sure, we understand that we have to love God more than our families, Christians often use catchphrases like God first, family second. 
when Christians say things like this, usually what they mean is you should love God first and God wants you to love your family, so you should love your family second. But if we're honest with ourselves, really honest about what Jesus is saying here, he doesn't seem to be saying God first, family second. He seems to be saying God first, period. Actually, he seems to be taking it even further than that. He seems to be saying, I didn't come to give you a big happy family where you all focus on the family and everyone in your family loves each other and gets along. I came to divide your family. I came to split you up. If you follow me, your family will be your enemies. And if that doesn't settle well with you, you're not worthy of me. I mean, that's what he said. He came to turn families against each other. The obvious implication is that loving God and obeying God doesn't mean loving our families or focusing on our families. In fact, Jesus is saying the opposite. So where does the church get this mindset that we should all focus on the family? Well, maybe this passage is just being taken out of context or being misunderstood. Maybe we should look at some of the other things Jesus had to say about family. All those who have left houses, brothers, sisters, father, mother, children, or farms, for my name's sake, will get more than they left, and they will inherit eternal life. Here, Jesus is saying that those who inherit eternal life will be those who left their families. Well, that's certainly not saying that we should focus on the family, so let's keep searching. Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. You must go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus said, Anyone who begins to plow a field but keeps looking back is of no use in the kingdom of God. In both of these passages, Jesus is saying the same thing he said in the earlier passage. If you love your family more than you love him, you're not worthy of him. Okay, this first dude, he just wanted to bury his dad. That's it. He's not saying he wouldn't live for the kingdom. He's just saying he wants to bury his dad first and then he'll live for the kingdom. But Jesus is saying, no, the kingdom of God has to be your number one priority. Even a funeral can't get in the way. And the second dude is ready to leave his family and follow Jesus. That's a bigger commitment than almost any modern Christian. The kingdom is so important to him that he is willing to leave his family. Yet Jesus says he's of no use in the kingdom of God. Why? Because saying goodbye to his family is a higher priority to him than the kingdom of God. How do we know it's a higher priority? Because he wanted to do it first. The kingdom of God always has to be first. The kingdom of God must remain the top priority. Even family can't come in the way. Jesus doesn't want people who are divided. Either you're loyal to Jesus or you're not. Either you have fidelity or you don't. Jesus wasn't interested in having half-hearted followers. If you're not willing to absolutely surrender your entire life over to doing what Jesus wants, proclaiming the kingdom, and giving up everything for him, Jesus doesn't want you to sign up. That's harsh, and that's the opposite of what churches preach today, but it's true. That's why when Jesus had large crowds following him, he didn't try to keep people from leaving. In fact, he did the opposite. Here's an example. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned to them and said, If anyone comes to me but does not hate 
his father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, or even his own life, he cannot be my follower. Whoever does not carry his own cross and follow me cannot be my follower. After saying this, Jesus went on telling those people that they need to count the cost of following him before they try to join. He said that if you want to build a tower, you don't just start building. First, you make sure you have everything you need to finish the job. Otherwise, you don't even try to start. Or if a king is going to war, first he makes sure he's got what it takes to win the war. Otherwise, he doesn't fight in the first place. And then Jesus said, In the same way, you must give up everything you have to be my follower. Salt is good, but if it loses its salty taste, you cannot make it salty again. It is no good for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Throughout this section, Jesus is telling us to recognize what it's going to cost in order to follow him. And he says that if you're not ready, don't sign up. If you're not willing to accept the cost, then don't try to follow him in the first place. If you're going to be half-hearted when you follow him, then he says the same thing he said to the man who prioritized his family. Don't bother. If you're going to keep looking back, you're of no use in my kingdom. He says you have to give up everything you have to be his follower. If you become the salt of the earth, but you lose your salty taste because you weren't ready for the extreme cost, Jesus says you're good for nothing, not even a pile of manure. He's literally saying, if you're not willing to accept the cost and you try to follow him anyway, you're not even good for a pile of animal crap. That's how serious Jesus is with this. With Jesus, you are either all in or you're all out. There's no such thing as a half-hearted or distracted follower of Jesus. As we've seen in earlier videos, the word in Greek that's translated faith actually means faith and faithfulness at the same time. It means fidelity. It means loyalty. Jesus is saying you can't be divided. You have to have absolute fidelity to him. You can't be half-hearted. If you're not willing to absolutely surrender your entire life over to doing what Jesus wants, then don't sign up. Count the cost. Look at what it's going to cost you before you agree to join. Otherwise, you might not have what it takes and you won't be of any use to him. So, Back to the beginning of this section in Luke 14, when Jesus is telling us to count the cost, he said, If anyone comes to me but does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, or even his own life, he cannot be my follower. Jesus obviously doesn't want us actually hating people but he also obviously wasn't worried about people getting offended and leaving he also obviously didn't want us to focus on the family and have family be our ministry he wants us so absurdly over the top in love with him that it seems like we don't care about anything or anyone else in comparison to how obsessed we are with him what does it mean to be this obsessed with Jesus? Most Christians seem to think it means having strong feelings, strong emotions, singing songs and crying. But that's not what Jesus says. He says being obsessed with him means we're doing things with our lives that make it look like we hate our families. 
Therefore, family is clearly not supposed to be the focus. Your ministry is clearly not supposed to be your family. Being obsessed with Jesus means we're doing things that not only make it seem like we hate our families, but it makes it seem like we hate even our own lives. That's what Jesus said. And if we're not this obsessed with Jesus and that sold out for him, he says we can't even be his followers. That's the cost Jesus is talking about. That's the cost he wants us to consider before we sign up. That's what it means to really follow Jesus. That's what it means to really love Jesus. After all, as we've already seen in this series, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Those who have my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. If people love me, they will obey my teaching. And John said, loving God means obeying his commands. Loving God and being obsessed with Jesus isn't about strong emotional feelings. As we've been talking about in these videos, it's about your priorities. Your actions speak louder than your words. Your actions show what you truly love most. What is most important to you? What are you building your life around? Jesus is saying it shouldn't be family. Christians today build their lives around their families and they think they're obeying God. They say the Christian life should be focused on the family and they think this idea comes from the Bible. But here's the reality. Jesus talked a lot about family. And every single time, he said the opposite of what the church says today. He never said to focus on the family. He never said your ministry can be your family. He never said to stay close to family. He never said to center your life on your family. He said he's going to divide families. He said you're going to have to leave your family. He said your family cannot be your priority. He said it's going to look like you hate them. So then the question is, why? If we are called to love others, why does Jesus want to divide families and separate families? Christians know Jesus told us to love others. That's exactly why they think it's important for us to focus on our families and have strong families that are built on love. That's why they do it. So why does Jesus seem to be saying the opposite? Well, he explains. If you love only the people who love you, you will get no reward. Even the tax collectors do that. And if you are nice only to your friends, you are no better than other people. Even the Gentiles are nice to their friends. Therefore, you must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. If you love only the people who love you, what praise should you get? Even sinners love the people who love them. If you do good only to those who do good to you, what praise should you get? Even sinners do that. When you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite only your friends, your family, your other relatives, and your rich neighbors. At another time, they will invite you to eat with them and you will be repaid. Instead, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then you will be blessed because they have nothing and cannot pay you back. But you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is his point. Yes, he commands us to love. But he's not commanding us to love our families, our friends, and everyone who will love us back. Why? Because that's what people do naturally. That's what unbelievers do. 
That's what sinners do. That's what the Gentiles do. That doesn't make us different. That doesn't make us holy. He says we must be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. Or as God said to Israel in the Old Testament, we must be holy because God is holy. He doesn't want us to look like all the unbelievers around us. He wants us to be different. And when he commands us to love, he wants that love to be different than theirs too. They love their friends. They love their families. They love those who love them back. If we only do the same, we're no different. He is commanding us to love with a different kind of love. A love where we love like he loves. His command to us was, I give you a new command. Love one another. You must love one another as I have loved you. This is my command. Love each other as I have loved you. We're commanded to love as he has loved us. That means our love for others should look just like his love for us. Our love should imitate his love. If we're imitating him, our focus won't be on our families and on those who love us back because his love wasn't focused on those who love him back. We were his enemies when he loved us. This is why Christianity is available to us as Gentiles. Paul says, remember that you are Gentiles in the flesh. Remember that in the past, you were without Christ. You were not citizens of Israel, and you were strangers in the covenants of promise. You had no hope, and you did not know God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far away from God are brought near through the blood of Christ. Christ himself is our peace. He made both Jews and Gentiles one people and broke down the wall of hate that divided them by giving his own body. His purpose was to make the two groups of people become one new people in him and in this way make peace. It was also Christ's purpose to end the hatred between the two groups, to make them into one body and to bring them back to God. Christ did all this with his death on the cross. Now, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer, but are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. And in Christ, you too are being built together with the Jews into a place where God lives through the Spirit. Those of us who were Gentiles, we weren't part of Israel. We weren't citizens. We were strangers. We were foreigners. We didn't have hope. We didn't know God. We were his enemies. But through Jesus, we were brought in. We're no longer foreigners, we're citizens. We belong to his family, we receive his spirit. The love of Jesus wasn't just that he looked out for his family, loved his family and his friends and made sure that their needs were met. No, his love was different. He loved his enemies. He loved those who were outside his family. He loved those who hated him. The same is true for those who are Jewish according to the flesh. God said to the Jews, You are not my people, and I am not your God. Even the Jews were not God's people. The writings of the prophets are filled with messages from God telling them that they had committed adultery against God. They had left him. They had abandoned him. And therefore, they were not his people. He wasn't their God. They weren't in his family. Paul said about the Jews, It is not that God failed to keep his promise to them, 
but only some of the people of Israel are truly God's people. And only some of Abraham's descendants are truly children of Abraham. And Jesus said to the Jews, If you were really Abraham's children, you would do the things Abraham did. If God were really your father, you would love me because I came from God and now I am here. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to do what he wants. The person who belongs to God obeys the words of God, but you don't obey because you don't belong to God. So neither the Jews nor the Gentiles were part of God's family. The only people who belong to God are those who obey God and not even the Jews who thought they were part of God's family were obeying him. So everyone, whether Jew or Gentile, had made themselves God's enemies. They weren't part of his family. They hated God. They rebelled against God. God told them, you are not my people. Here's the point. Jesus didn't only love those who loved him back. His love that we are supposed to emulate wasn't about loving his friends and loving his family. He loved us while we were his enemies. His radical, extreme, and costly love was directed to those outside of his family. He didn't focus on the family, and his family wasn't his ministry. He focused on those outside of his family, the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the helpless, the sick, and the slaves. Okay, we were poor and he was rich. So he made himself poor so that we could become rich. We were hungry and he gave his body so we could eat. We were thirsty and he poured out his blood so we could drink. We were strangers and he welcomed us into his home and made us part of his family. We were sick and by his wounds we are healed. We were prisoners and slaves of sin and he paid our ransom with his own life. His command to us is that we go and do the same. So Christians aren't called to build their lives around their families. They aren't called to love those who love them back. They aren't called to focus on the family. Christians are called to love complete strangers the same way that most people only love their families. More than that, Christians are called to love complete strangers with a love that most people wouldn't even show toward their own families. God wants people who prioritize what he prioritizes. He wants people who love with his love. He wants people who give everything to the kingdom without holding anything back, even if it costs them everything that's important to them. As Jesus said, you must give up everything you have to be my follower. Family is not the exception. As Christians, we know that we're saved by having the same kind of faith that Abraham had. But as we've been talking about throughout this series, if Abraham hadn't obeyed God, we wouldn't be saying that Abraham had faith. His obedience was part of his faith. And if we're supposed to have the same kind of faith Abraham had, then we should have the same kind of obedience Abraham had. So let me ask you, what was the first command God gave Abraham? The first command God gave to Abraham was this. Leave your country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land I will show you. Jesus isn't the first one to say that following God means leaving your family. God has always said that his kingdom is a higher priority than family. And as the writer of Hebrews summarizes, it was by faith Abraham obeyed God's call to go to another place God promised to give him. He left his own country not knowing where he was going. 
It was by faith that he lived like a foreigner in the promised land. Abraham was waiting for the city that had real foundations, the city planned and built by God. They recognized that they were like foreigners and visitors on earth. When people say such things, they show that they are looking for a country that will be their own. If they had been thinking about the country they had left, they could have gone back. But they were waiting for a better country, a heavenly one. So God is not ashamed to be called their God because he has prepared a city for them. If Abraham had said, my family is my ministry, I need to focus on my family, then no one would be talking about the faith of Abraham. We would be talking about how he didn't have faith. God called Abraham to leave his family and he obeyed. As Hebrews explains, that obedience was part of his faith. It showed that he prioritized the kingdom of God instead of his family. If he had prioritized his family and the country he had left, he could have gone back. He could have returned to them. His faith was demonstrated in that he prioritized God's kingdom rather than his own family. Jesus is calling us to do the same. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be people who live in this world like we're foreigners. We're just visiting. This isn't where we belong, so we're not focused on the things of this world. Like Abraham recognized that he was a visitor on this earth, we need to recognize that we don't belong to this world. We don't belong to this world any more than Jesus belongs to this world. When Jesus was praying for us, Jesus said, They don't belong to the world, just as I don't belong to the world. I am not asking that you take them out of the world, but to protect them from the evil one. They don't belong to the world just as I don't belong to the world. Make them holy through your truth. Your teaching is truth. We don't belong to the world. Jesus doesn't belong to the world. We are made holy, different, through the truth. And God's teaching is truth. We're not made holy through hearing his teaching. We're made holy through doing his teaching. This is the teaching you have heard from the beginning. We must love each other. We are made different than the world by living in love. The kind of love Jesus showed for us. It separates us. It makes us different. It makes us stand out. It makes us shine. Jesus said, all people will know that you are my followers if you love one another. The only way that could be true is if our love is different than everyone else. If our love looks the same as everyone else's love, then there's no one who's going to know that we're his followers simply by seeing our love. Our love has to be different. It has to make us stand out. It has to be radical. Our love comes from having different priorities. We have different priorities than everyone else in the world. Our love is different because there's something more important to us than our friends, our family, and our own lives. If we're born again, children of God living by the Spirit, then we should have the same priorities God has. So many Christians get this wrong. If they're not focused on their kids, they're focused on their marriage. How many times have you read a Christian book on marriage? How many times have you listened to a sermon on marriage? How many times have you heard Christian marriage counseling? How many times have you talked to married Christian couples about marriage? Christians are almost always saying you have to focus on your marriage. They say you need to build a strong marriage. Christians think you need to spend time settling into marriage before they can really do anything else. Christian marriage advice almost always says stuff like, 
Spend time together, go on dates, get to know each other. Focus on what the other person wants. I've heard many Christians say things like, we're focusing on our marriage right now. Is this biblical? Sure, husbands and wives should spend time together. They should talk to each other. They should get to know each other. Paul said husbands should love their wives and wives should love their husbands. But Paul also gave another piece of marriage advice. Paul said this, Brothers and sisters, this is what I mean. The time is short. So starting now, those who have wives should live as if they had no wives. How often do you hear that verse brought up in a book on marriage or at a marriage conference or in Christian marriage counseling? Paul's marriage advice is don't live like you're married. What's he talking about? Well, he explains what he's saying. He says, I want you to be free from concern. A man who is not married is concerned with the Lord's work, trying to please the Lord. But a man who is married is concerned with the things of the world, trying to please his wife. He must think about two things, pleasing his wife and pleasing the Lord. A woman who is not married or a betrothed woman is concerned with the Lord's work. She wants to be holy in body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned with the things of the world as to how she can please her husband. I'm saying this to help you, not to limit you. But I want you to live in the right way, to give yourselves fully to the Lord without distraction. So, he's saying... People who are married should live as if they're not married because people who are not married aren't distracted. They're focused on the Lord's work, the kingdom of God. Or at least that's how it's supposed to be. But people who are married get distracted with each other. They're thinking about how to please one another. In other words, he's saying that trying to build a strong marriage and focus on your marriage is a distraction. His exact words were concerned with the things of the world. Okay, Christians tend to think that the things of the world are just material things. We shouldn't be distracted with material things. And that's true. We talked about that in an earlier video. But here Paul is saying that if we're focused on trying to please our spouse, then we're distracted with the things of the world. Why? Because the things of the world are all the things that pertain to this world and this life and are not about the kingdom of God. It's not just material possessions. It's everything. So many Christians also think that they have to focus on their marriage because their marriage is struggling. They're fighting. They're arguing. They're unhappy. The church comes along and tells them that they need to spend time focusing on their marriage and spend time with each other in order to solve these problems. Quite frankly, it's no different than the same marriage advice you'd get from an unbeliever. It's not solving the problem. In fact, it's making it worse. James says that we fight and we argue because of our own selfish desires. We want things and we don't have them. His very next point is what we talked about in an earlier video. If you want things for your own pleasure, you're an adulterer. You hate God. You're his enemy. You're not giving yourself to God alone. So if our marriages are struggling, if we're fighting and we're arguing and we're unhappy, what's the real problem? And what's the real solution? James says the real problem is that you want things for yourself. You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about what's good for you rather than thinking about the kingdom of God and what's good for others. Therefore, you're committing adultery against God. You're not keeping fidelity with God. So is the solution spend time with each other and focus on yourselves? Or is the solution get your selfish desires under control and get your priorities straight? You're living for the wrong things. 
That's what James is saying, and that's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, stop trying to please each other and instead make everything you do about pleasing the Lord without distraction by one another. Give yourselves to God alone. The church's solution for marriage problems is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible's solution is get your eyes off of yourselves. Stop focusing about how unhappy you are and how bad your marriage is, and instead start focusing on the kingdom and live for the kingdom without distraction. If Christians would live that way, they wouldn't be fighting and arguing. Because instead of focusing on their own selfish desires, they would be focusing on the kingdom of God. Instead of thinking about themselves, they would be thinking about the lost, the poor, the needy, the dying, the lame, the blind, the crippled, the naked, the thirsty, and the hungry. They would be thinking about what they could do to show the radical love of Jesus to others. And with both of them thinking about that, suddenly they would find themselves living as a team, working together with a common purpose. If your focus is on having a happy marriage, you'll never have a happy marriage because your focus will be on pleasing one another instead of pleasing God. The only important thing is the kingdom of God. It is the priority. It is what comes first, not your marriage. In Luke 14, Jesus told a parable about a king who threw a feast and invited a ton of people to come to the feast. But one by one, they made excuses. And one of those excuses was, we just got married, we can't come. He ends the parable by saying that none of those people who made excuses will taste his banquet. Okay, Jesus won't accept your marriage as an excuse. If you focus on your marriage instead of the kingdom, You are distracted, you're divided, you don't have loyalty, you don't have fidelity, and that means you don't have faith. And if you don't have faith, you won't find yourself participating in the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what Jesus is saying in that parable. For those of you who are single, the same concept applies to you. Is marriage your goal? Is it what you dream about? Is it what you're working toward? Because if so, your priorities are wrong. The kingdom of God is not your goal. It's not what you want most. It's not what you're working toward. You have a higher priority, something you love more than God. Paul said to singles, if you are not married, do not try to find a wife. He's not saying it's a sin to get married, but he's saying you can't live for marriage. He's saying the same thing he's saying to married people. You need to live for the kingdom without distraction. Nearly every unbeliever in the world is looking for romance. They're looking for that special someone who they're hoping will make them happy. They're looking for intimacy. They're looking for companionship. They're looking for some kind of relationship. Christian singles today, in general, are no different. I know I was no different. I wanted to get married more than anything else. I often made plans with friends simply because I wanted to be around that one particular girl I liked. I did everything I could to get some kind of romantic relationship. I was no different than the world. I wasn't set apart for God. I wasn't holy. I thought I was honoring God because I was saving myself for marriage. But I wasn't honoring God. I was rebelling against Him. I was abandoning Him as I threw myself into a pursuit to find happiness in anyone other than Him. I thought I loved God, but I hated Him. I thought I loved God, but I had another master. The kingdom of God was not my priority. Therefore, I didn't love God. I didn't stay holy. I became like the world. 
Hey, Jesus isn't looking for people who just don't have sex until marriage. That's not what being pure is about. Christians have missed the whole point. They've taken verses they don't understand and they turn them into laws that they say people have to obey. Paul said, the purpose of our commands is for people to have love, a love that comes from a pure heart and a clear conscience and a genuine faith or fidelity. But some people have missed this whole point. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not understand either what they are talking about or what they so confidently assert. The purpose of everything the New Testament says is for people to have true, biblical, radical love. A love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. That genuine faith is genuine fidelity. It's an undistracted, undivided heart. The point is that you're supposed to live a life defined by radical love where you prioritize others above yourself and you're completely undistracted by the things of this world, including romantic relationships. It's not about law. It's about fidelity. It's about loyalty. It's about not getting distracted by this life. Jesus wants people who give up everything for him. Jesus is looking for people who completely stop living for this world and this life. He wants people who have died to this life and no longer live for themselves but live for Him. He wants people who are undivided, undistracted. Being different is about not being like the world. Being holy is about offering our entire lives as a sacrifice to God. It's about living like we're just visiting this earth. It's about living like aliens. As long as we keep getting distracted by anything in this short, temporary life, we're no different. Paul said, A soldier wants to please the commanding officer, so no one serving in the army wastes time with everyday matters. It doesn't matter what those everyday matters are. If your focus is not on pleasing your commanding officer, you're not following him. In Philippians, Paul talks about how everything that was once important to him is now worth nothing to him. He says that he considers it the same as worthless trash. He says the only important thing to him now is living for Jesus and becoming like him and knowing him. And he tells the Philippians to imitate him in this and think this way too. But then he contrasts that to those who don't adopt this way of thinking. He says, Many people live like enemies of the cross of Christ. I have often told you about them, and it makes me cry to tell you about them now. In the end, they will be destroyed. They do whatever their bodies want. They are proud of their shameful acts and they think only about earthly things. Do you live as an enemy of the cross of Christ? Or do you live as someone who is completely devoted to the kingdom of God without distraction? Do you do whatever your body wants? Do you realize that that includes making marriage your priority, even if you save yourself for marriage? If you want to get married and your actions show that this is your priority, you're still doing whatever your body wants, even if you do in fact wait until marriage. That's not God's standard of purity. God's standard of purity is when all you care about is Him and His kingdom and obeying His commands to prioritize the needs of others. Prioritizing marriage and prioritizing having your own family is not what God wants. It's what your body wants. Are you proud of your shameful acts? 
Shameful acts include only thinking about relationships, only thinking about having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, or only thinking about getting married. Are you thinking only about earthly things? Earthly things include relationships. Earthly things include family. Earthly things include marriage. Only one thing is important. To me, the only important thing about living is Christ.